All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the fifth day of March in the year of our Lord, 2023, and counting. I hope it won't count much higher. I We should get a new calendar uh, when Christ returns, right? The year of our Lord's kingdom, present and visible on earth. The millennium, which indeed will come to pass. It is necessary. As Irenaeus uh, realized, well, actually... Uh, taught in the second century. Irenaeus, you know, the, the disciple of Polycarp, the martyr, who was a disciple of John the Apostle, you know, who tells us that uh, that the book of Revelation was written, what, uh, about nine, in the early 90s? <laughs> Not prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, which all the preterists tried to do to it. Yeah. <laughs> so we... Uh, it's amazing. See, people that have a theology don't care about truth. They care about their theology. And, I mean, a man-made theology. And they uh, will, well, it, think of the Biden White House. What is truth to those people? Nothing, nothing. And the same thing happens. It's just like Francis. I mean, Francis is on a crusade against Latin mass now. I mean, he is, he is persecuting Roman Catholics, young families, devout Catholics that want real Catholicism, which is not the gospel, but, I mean, compared to what Francis offers, the, the, uh, the Pachamamas and uh, green, Greenism and Socialism and Globalism, that, Francis is, oh, uh, uh, let's see, what, what was that? Uh, I think he's actually a devotee of Pierre uh, de Chardin, who was a new who's you will find those books in any New Age bookshop if there are such things around anymore. But yeah, he was uh, um, silenced. A, he was a Jesuit, and he was silenced by the Church, and then rehabilitated by Francis by including references to him in his what was it uh, his uh, first encyclical first real encyclical that Francis wrote, now, which was about uh, Laudato Si. That, that, that is a green globalist antichrist agenda, if there ever was one. And then the, 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 confer, the what is it, was the Amazonian Synod, which didn't take place in Amazonia, of course. That'd be too uncomfortable for the fat homosexual bishops. Now, he, he, when when uh, was our, our Archbishop Vigano uh, call says the Vatican is run by a, a homosexual mafia? So who's the head of the Vatican? Who's the godfather of that mafia? Godfather, yeah, for a man that calls himself the vicar of Christ, which means the replacement for Christ, the substitute for Christ, which is exactly what the word antichristos means. See, anti in Greek, the prefix anti means both against and in place of. A perfect description of the papacy that claims himself uh, to be uh, the presence of the visible presence of Christ on earth. No, he's not. I, you know, with all the evil, what what I can't understand. Of course, you see, if, if a true Christian has received the love of the truth, I mean, and, and I abandoned Lutheranism 
and I've tried. I, you know, there are elements in Luther. Let me say this about Luther first. The, the church that is in some ways closest to the gospel in this area is a Lutheran Church Missouri Synod as far as a preacher preaching the gospel. Um, but, <laughs> there's a big but there. They, they are utterly sectarian. Uh, it's like, no, how can you can't do that. You cannot restrict uh, the Lord's table to people that hold to the Book of Concord. <laughs> Uh, but they don't. I'm sure they don't see their their utter sinfulness in doing that. Uh, but I have to say, Luther was. I'm going to use the term bipolar, but more in a chemical sense than a uh, psychological sense. In the sense that he has these two two attractions. One end attracts to the Bible and to the gospel that we are saved by the grace of God through faith alone, in Christ alone. Grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. That's Luther's true message. But there's this other Luther, the old Luther, the Luther that Luther that is attracted to the, that, that still holds to the one true church and Roman Catholicism and, and all the things that he was, he was brought up in and taught and committed to and suffered for. So he's bipolar. He's got one end. It's just like a, a uh, in, in chemistry, you have these things called emulsifiers, soap, soaps. Okay, a soap has one end that's that 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 is that is attracted to oil. The oil will will grab onto one end of the soap molecule, and water the other end, and it brings two in, incompatible things together, emulsifies them, and that's what Lutheranism is. It's emulsified law and gospel. <laughs> Our emulsified Roman Catholicism and gospel. Uh, mixing the gospel into Roman Catholicism does not solve the problem. <laughs> it just confuses it. And they got the emulsifier in there. How do you get the, the oil and the water separated again? Well, you have to remove the emulsifier, which is, which is Luther. Now, I'm, I'm not, I mean, Luther was a very important person. And quite heroic, and but he he you know and he was he probably in order for him to do it in, in God's grace and mercy, he almost had to focus on that one thing, otherwise he'd confuse the issue. But he did confuse the issue with like with his images. Oh, that's not important. <laughs> images aren't important, even though he knew he obviously knew that people worshipped them. They're not. You cannot take an object of worship and just say, "Well, that we'll just keep it as an instructional tool." No, the Bible says, "Avoid them." In the in First John, keep yourself from idols, images, and that particular. I, I did not know that Lutherans still some Lutherans cling to. Images, what they do. I mean, three-dimensional statues, like crucifixes. Yes, the, the crucifixion of Christ is central to the gospel. But he rose from the dead. He didn't stay on the cross. And that's a, an inter-Lutheran thing. Well, it was. <laughs> Who knows what it is now? <sighs> when the majority of Lutherans have gone and <laughs> deep-sixed themselves uh, into utter apostasy. Anyway, <clears throat> what this video is about, I haven't done a video for a while. And really, um, other things have come up. I couldn't think of anything to say that I hadn't already said. Uh, and the actually, the uh, my uh, the dawning of what was really the issue among the uh, Nazarenes and the holy, which is extend that to the holiness movement, extend that to John Wesley and his followers in general, extend that to all kinds of denominations that aren't related to the uh, uh, descendants of Wesley, uh, Churches of Christ, the American Restoration Movement, you know, uh, 
Roman Catholicism, Methodism, or Methodism, I never said that, Mormonism, uh, a whole bunch of things uh, that really are uh, gospelless. No gospel there. They don't understand the gospel. The Nazarenes, and I have nothing against the people, I think they're often wonderful people. But as it became increasingly clear, and I actually pulled out as much official documentation as I could, as far as, you know, official doctrine. So you, you look in their handbook and you really don't see it because it's not important. It's, it's like, you know, one of the oddball things about Lutheranism, you think that it's all about grace through faith in Christ, right? The gospel isn't present in Luther's small catechism. The Ten Commandments are. It's the same as a Catholic catechism. The, the, the commandments, you have the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed. Now, all these have Luther's understanding of them attached, and we had to memorize. Not just the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed and the other things, but Luther's understanding. And you have, um, what else, uh, the sacraments. Luther's condensed version of the sacraments with his meanings. But no gospel. No gospel. No sections on how we're saved by the grace of God alone through faith alone in Christ alone. So apparently, by the time Luther got around to creating his his new uh, small catechism, which I think he was... When he, was rather proud of to instruct children or to help parents instruct children, their children. Luther seems to have forgotten the gospel. Wouldn't that be central in educating your children that they're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not by law, not by being a member of a church? Hmm. That was the older Luther, not the younger Luther. Not the that's not the Luther at the Wittenberg church door with the hammer and the ninety five theses, which were not about the gospel either, by the way. That was the beginning of his awakening, really. Oh my Jesus Christ. I won't you can look it up yourself. He, he says, <clears throat> at one point in the Gospels, he says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man returns, now, uh, under Roman Catholicism, he doesn't really return. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Will he find the faith? There's a definite article there, by the way. The faith on the earth. Not faith in general. Because people have faith in Joe Biden, some people. The Biden cult. Ugh. Yeah, talk, you know, him and Francis, two peas in a pod. And we know who the pod is, the devil. But then that's where we all were, or are, unless we're born again. And why I'm doing this is I happen to do something I haven't done in a long time. I mean, other than make a video that I actually post. We'll see if it gets posted or not. <clears throat> or you'll see if it gets posted. I don't know yet. Uh, I happen to go and take a look at uh, Alpha and Omega to see what James White is harping on lately. I mean, he's 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 gone so far away, you know. When he he's not even a Calvinist anymore, really. He's a a theonomist. He went. He's gone off on the Rush Dooney pathway to hell. Um. Back to the law. He's a Judaizer now. And uh, but anyway, I, there was this video, and it says apologizing for the Bible, textual critical issues in the TR. And I haven't listened to all of it. I couldn't get that far. 
Uh, he starts apologizing for the Bible. It's an attack on Andy Stanley. Okay, Andy Stanley's a pretty easy target. So is Charles Stanley. <laughs> so are Southern Baptists in general. They have a gospel deficiency syndrome there. Uh, they are, it's it's a it's cultural Southern Christian Protestant Christianity. It is not, and their foundations were were not good. Uh, actually, the Southern Baptist is nothing but a missionary organization. Who are is trying? Who has a, a spirit of totalitarianism now? But uh, they're not. Well, yet, although there's obviously the, the direction is heading toward a true de denominational with centralized power, which is a sin against God. It's, it's contrary to the scripture. It, again, you, you've got, they become the vicar of Christ. They, they're not content with Christ ruling over his people. They, they don't believe the gospel. They need to rule over his people. That's called sin. Anyway, I started listening to this, and he, he starts, I didn't know it was about Andy Stanley, and he starts, well, I see in the description it says, started off with personal response to Andy, Andy Stanley on his apologizing for Christians seeking to apply Christian rules to non-Christians. That's called theonomy, brothers and sisters, theonomy. That's seeking to apply, to to use the state now remember calvinism is a state religion uh, lutheranism is a state religion it doesn't really fit in the united states it is a magisterial it was the magis called the, what's called the magisterial reformation in other words the reformation from the government down the kings imposing it too or the princes in luther's case it was, it was, its power, its authority is in the government. The government is the enforcer of it. Uh. <laughs> and of course, that's the death knell. See, if Christ is not king, but the king is king, if uh, Henry VIII is the king, not Christ, of the church, well, guess what happens? Anglicanism happens. Uh, what happens when you have Prince King Charles? It's hard to say, King Charles. Uh, let's see. So, Chris, uh, uh, apologizing. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. So, so what is this really saying? What is what is what is James White into now at Apology at Church? And you see videos with him with with. Uh, uh, Boot, Joseph Boot, uh, who's wrote, this is the real Bible of Apology at Church. Joe Boot is a theonomist, which is a particular disease among Calvinists, because Calvinists can't distinguish the Old Covenant from the New. It's a death knell to the gospel. So I started listening to this. I didn't read the description. And I want to listen here to uh, roughly uh, 10 minutes of it, uh, if we can endure that. But he takes clips from an Andy Stanley sermon and attacks them. Uh, you need to listen to what the what Andy Stanley's actually saying in the clips that James White chooses to attack. So let's do that now. And it's interesting because uh, Andy, of course, did the unbelievable radio broadcast with Jeff Durbin on unhitching from the Old Testament. We've talked about the influence of his views regarding. Uh, it's the minimalist facts apologetic approach in essence where uh you know he's basically saying 
you know, it's not the authority of Scripture. It's the reality of the resurrection. And, of course, my response. Yes. Actually, that's where the Bible lays the evidence. What did Paul say? That he's on Mars Hill. Paul says that God is now commanding everyone everywhere to repent, having furnished proof to all man, all mankind, all men, by what? Raising Christ from the dead. The resurrection. You have the, 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 what is the Bible? It's a testimony to God's works of salvation. If you, if you forget what the center is, it's the red cross and the, the death and resurrection of Christ. The Bible says, the, the testimony of Scripture of the Apostle Paul says it is the resurrection. What do the apostles go about preaching after Pentecost? Christ risen from the dead. Because that's the proof of, that God has given of who he is. It's not the, the, the Jews had the Bible, the Old Testament. But that is not the salvation of God. Christ is the salvation of God. Not the Bible. The Bible is a witness to it, not the thing itself. <laughs> response from the beginning has been... But if you're a theonomist, the law is the central center. You're, you're a Judaizer. You're trying to put Christians and everybody else under the law of Moses. You don't know what the resurrection means. You don't know why the cross took place. You don't have to know those things. What, what does Paul say in, in Romans chapter 10? First of all, the gospel is that Jesus Christ came, died for our sins, and rose from the dead, uh, proving that he accomplished his salvific work. That he took your sins. Now, Calvinists don't believe this. He took the sins of the entire world upon himself. John, 1 John, chapter 2, verse 2. Let's take a little gander over there. This is, this is a verse Calvinists, or at least James White, hates. Oh, yeah, well, well I'm here, Romans 3, 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law... No flesh shall be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law can save no one. The law can't reconcile you with God. <sighs> okay, where are we? What happened to it? Well, I'll just have to look it up, I guess. So let's go to, uh, to John, 1 John, not John. 1 John 2. Two, two. For he himself, that's Christ, is the propitiation. That's the same word in the Greek, hilosmos, that is used in the Old Testament. That's the, the word they use to translate mercy seat. You know, the lid on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the, 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 the tablets of the law, uh, on which the blood was poured for on the Day of Atonement. He himself is a propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Whole world. All sin. Yeah. Which means he is the savior of all, whether or not they actually are saved depends on whether they trust in him. We are saved by the grace of God, which is really Christ himself, through faith in him. It's not understanding. You don't have to understand uh, that, but no. Um, in fact, we're going to go over, let's see, Romans 10. Okay, while well, we're here, so, you know, James White once said something that really struck me. We should always go in the scriptures to where the subject is actually taught rather than just 
extraneous references. So where is how we're saved actually taught? Romans chapter 10. You notice James White avoids Romans chapter 10. He's talking about the word of faith. What? He, he just, Romans, how many chapters has Paul taught in Romans on faith? We're saved by faith rather than works. Faith in Christ, not of works. And then, he, then in Romans chapter 10, he talks about the Jews, the unbelieving Jews who are, who have, he says they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And rather than uh, believing, uh, trusting in the righteousness God provides for us. Now, James White's not going to argue with that. They try to establish their own righteousness. That's what Nazarenes generally do, and so many others generally do. They, they try to become holy enough to be acceptable to God. Their acceptance before God depends on their holiness, not on God's holiness, and not on Christ's righteousness their own righteousness. And what does that do? That damns you. That damns you. You cut yourself off. Galatians, you cut yourself off. If you, if you add to what God has done to save us in Christ and Christ alone, by adding obedience to the law or whatever, add commandments. What was the first uh, ecumenical council you know, the, the, in Jerusalem about? Well, it was about, do the Gentiles have to be circumcised and be taught to keep the law? And the answer was, no. No. The law is not part of the gospel at all, Calvinists. It's not grace. How, how can you read Paul and get the idea that the, God, that the law is, is grace? That's nonsense. You don't know what grace is. But that's when you, you're committed to a system of theology rather than, you know, like Luther. He had, his, you know, I talk about Luther being bipolar. He had, the, had the, uh, the Catholic end and then the biblical end, you know, and the molecules. <laughs> well, you can imagine the tension that creates in you <laughs> because they're not compatible. Yeah, they're, it's like building your house on the San Andreas Fault. One half is going one direction, the other half, the half is going the other direction. It's not going to be good. You'll start having cracks if, if the whole thing isn't taken down. So it starts here by, by saying, don't say in your heart, I will do this and I will do that, ascend into heaven or descend into the abyss. But what does it say? The word of faith. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now, this is not the, the, the faith word of faith, you know, the faith teachers. They're just devils. That if, what is the word of faith? Well, he doesn't leave us in the dark. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus as Lord, as your Lord, in other words, you, you confess, it's like citizenship, you know, you're, or oath of allegiance, oath of, of enlistment in the military or something. You put yourself under his authority. You call upon him to save you, be your Savior and Lord. Now, certain elements that are open to attack that uh, Andy Stanley might be included in would be the lack of submission to Christ as Lord. But, I mean, you also realize that you cannot, your obedience is not ever sufficient. You just throw yourself into his, into his mercy. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. That is the proof. Andy Stanley is absolutely, absolutely right. It is about the death and resurrection of Christ. That is the center. That is the proof. The, the, what is the Bible without that? It's a resurrection. And when you talk about the authority of the Bible, you start with Christ. He's the one that rose from the dead. You can't make claims for the authority of the Bible on something else. What is it then? 
Christ rose from the dead. What did Christ say about the scriptures? You start with him. He's the center. Always. So if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, believing truly that he is the Messiah, the promised one, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who is God himself, become man, who died for our sins, and he can save us. See, even a child can understand the gospel. Cal which proves Calvinism is absolutely wrong because Calvinism is probably the most difficult thing to understand because it's all about intellectualism and and theology, uh, philosophy, uh, and logic, man's wisdom. It depends on Aristotle, really. You might it dressed up as Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, but it's Aristotle behind it, the pagan. Classical Christian theism is paganism. It's not Christian theism at all. That's what the Bible reveals. They deny what the Bible reveals. Calvinism is anti-scripture. They take the pieces they like and discard the rest. Like this, how are you saved? Well, James White is uh, God's election. That's not what Paul says. He's teaching, teaching about what, how you're saved. You're not saved by works, you're saved by... Trusting in Christ, calling upon the Lord. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. What is a testimony? What Paul just wrote the entire book of Romans about this. When was, it's like the issue of circumcision. Paul asked the question, when was Abraham pronounced righteous? Before he was circumcised or after? Before. And why was Abra why did God reckon Abraham as righteous? Because Abraham believed God. Was Abraham a Calvinist? Did he have to know all that stuff? Did he have to understand Calvinistic covenantal theology? No. <laughs> he knew almost nothing compared to anybody that has a New Testament. And the law didn't even exist. Yet he was declared righteous, apart from the law of Moses, which is part of Paul's argument right there. In Romans, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You believe God. You believe God's testimony about Christ. And then you confess Christ as your Lord and Savior, which is really what baptism is about. You can skip the water. It's the confession. It is calling upon the Lord to save you, as Paul makes clear. For whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, for there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. Uh, the Greeks didn't have the law of Moses. <laughs> For the same Lord is, is rich to all who call upon him. Yes, you have to call upon him to save you. Not to call upon the pastor or the church or Moses. On Christ himself. It's a personal thing with Christ. It's a, it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and God in Christ. For whoever believes in him will not be put... For there's no... Okay, wherever. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. What's the name of the Lord? Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Jesus is the name, is the only name given among men by which we might be saved. Apart from him, there's no salvation. You cannot be saved in anybody else or faith in anything else other than Christ himself. All right. So let's go back to James White. That was a rather extended rabbit trail, but all of the entire apostolic interpretation. Uh, excuse me. It really wasn't a rabbit trail. It's what we're getting at here. It's the central aspect. of It's what the gospel is. Of what all that means. Cannot be unhitched from the Old Testament. Okay, this goes back to, to Andy Stanley 
saying we have to unhitch the Old Testament. Well, James White doesn't care what people are actually thinking when they say things. He's a debater. He's, he's not as smart as he tries to appear. Um, he doesn't really think much. But, I mean, if you, it's, it's a matter of wisdom, okay? It's like Andy Stanley. People can say things that you can either take as being bad or take as like, well, not really. What's he trying to get at? Now, I don't think an awful lot of Andy Stanley or any megachurch pastor, if you got a huge congregation, it's probably because you're telling people what they want to hear. Um, I don't know of any megachurch pastor that preaches the gospel, especially J, uh, John MacArthur. He doesn't preach the gospel. John MacArthur's church is, should really be called John MacArthur Incorporated. It's sort of, or sort of like uh, Joel Osteen's church. It's just for a different group of people. The Bible cannot save you. Only Christ is the Savior. Knowledge of the Scripture does not save you. Belonging to John MacArthur's church will not save you. It's not about salvation. It's not about the gospel. Listen to his sermons. They're not about the gospel. They're usually not even about the Bible, really. He just throws all kinds of stuff in there. It's a salad. A MacArthur salad. Word salad. Okay. But uh, with sometimes we we just take a very a sound bite and just condemn someone for a sound bite. Now, it's like I, I Charles Stanley, Andy Stanley's father, uh, no. Uh, Southern Baptists in general, no. I've never heard the gospel really preached in a Southern Baptist church. Uh, but, but the object, uh, why was Stanley saying, I'm going to imp- I'm going to try to uh, uh, set out a possibility that what Stanley was talking about when he was talking about unhitching the Old Testament was unhitching the law of Moses, and uh, which was you know in the culture wars um, from the gospel. That that would be the best light you could possibly put on it, which is absolutely necessary. The gos- the law brings death. Now James White doesn't believe that anymore. He's a theonomist now, and he'll mention flourishing culture. You need the law for that. Wrong, wrong. He's 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 uh, James White doesn't believe the gospel. Not really. He's a He's the world, uh, probably the Internet's foremost promoter of Calvinism, and now he's gone into aberrant Calvinism, which is what theonomy is. It, theonomy, uh, uh, genuine Calvinists uh, reject theonomy. They, they uh, you know, people like Rush Tooney and those people are, are like, uh, just rejected. And Doug Wilson and all the kind of people that James White hangs with are considered a, um, heretical. Well, they have, they probably wouldn't use the word heretical because they have church courts and things like that. It's a legal term for them. But biblically, uh, aberrant um, Calvinism. And Calvinism itself is aberrant Christianity. So, sorry, but it's true. A lot of things, it takes a while to understand what it really is. Just like... uh, Nazarenes. I never, I, I never started going to the church with any kind of idea that I'd become a Nazarene. Absolutely not. But I, I didn't understand that there was no gospel there. I thought it was like, you know, all these silly rules and stuff added, just confused, like Lutheranism, confused and confused. Yeah, bring confused to put two things together that don't work together, like oil and water. Yeah, uh, they, they never actually combine. <laughs> they can be held together, but only by special means. And they'll separate as soon as they get a chance. 
there is a different nature to oils and waters. One's polar and one's nonpolar. Uh, anyway, yeah, uh, uh, Andy Stanley it, with that note, moti uh, no, I would suspect that that's the best that that his motivation for trying to decouple the Old Testament is the some of the commandments in the current culture are a stumbling block to people. Do you have to come to accept the law of Moses in order to be saved? What does the Bible say? No. Uh, the first council the, was about that whole issue. Do the Gentiles have to be circumcised and keep the law? The Judaizers, the party of the Pharisees among the Christians, said yes. And they had their church meeting about that, and James, who was the head of that party, had a conversion. He said, no, they don't. <laughs> it's amazing that God chose James to, to come up with the answer because he was the, the head of the party that was causing the problem, or at least followers of James were causing the problem. So by God using him to come up with the, no, they don't, God brought unity. All right, so. Because <laughs> apparently James' followers were causing the problems. So here, uh, but Andy Stanley, the, the, see, we have the culture wars. The law, we have to, as Christians, we have to understand the law is not the gospel. One of the local communities for years, they've had like signs, front yard kind of signs that somebody had made up. Uh, it said, we, we believe in the Ten Commandments. I, this is probably coming from Church of Christ. Uh, there's a lot of those around here. So, Paul in Romans starts out saying the Gentiles by nature know these things. They already have a law, even if they don't have the law of Moses. They already know certain things are right and wrong because God has put it, written it on their hearts or minds. So they don't need to hear the law of Moses. The book of the New Testament that, that goes the deepest into rooting that historical event of the crucifixion, the book of Hebrews, is is the the you know I'm actually looking. We we actually, Rich was just doing some stuff with our current RV that we're trading in. And we had to put some stuff back in it that we had taken out and things like that. And um, so it's sitting out, and I can see it on my screen over here. I've got it. It's not the best neighborhood. We've said that many times. And so we keep an eye on stuff. So it's parked out in the parking lot uh, on, uh, on Doggy, the truck. And um, uh, so I'm keeping a, keeping a close eye on it. And it's still hitched to the truck, even though it's on its – I put, I put the struts down so that – the jacks are down so that it's stable while we – Oh, we were inside so we could work on stuff. It's still attached to the truck. And the book of Hebrews is like that hitch, fifth wheel hitch. Have you ever seen a fifth wheel hitch? It's not small. It is not small. It's a, it's a big, heavy chunk of metal. It has to be to do what it does. And that's what Hebrews is, connecting the old and the new. Okay, let me tell you something about the book of Hebrews. First of all, it was one of the last books accepted in the New Testament. Because one of the criteria uh, in the early church for recognition of uh, writings as uh, given by God was they were written by an apostle. There is no evidence that the book of Hebrews, contrary to, just because the King James book says the, 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 uh, the epistle of the Hebrews, as by Paul's epistle to the Hebrews or something like that, does not mean that that's there in the Greek. It's not. There is no author identified. The authority of the book of Hebrews is based on its content and its consistency with the rest of Scripture and, and the, the, bear, the witness of the Spirit for it. Uh, 
again, it was slow to acceptance because it was not identified with the, an apostle. So, uh, but it's written to a particular audience, and that audience is Jewish Christians. It's not a, a epistle written to Christians in general. They were under pressure, they were under persecution to return to Moses. And it is, uh, and the art, the whole epistle is written to encourage them not to do it and to declare there is no hope under Moses. If you if you go back to the law, you've cut yourself off from Christ. The law is obsolete; it cannot save you. There is no forgiveness under the law. It is the old covenant. In fact, it actually says it's obsolete because the new has come. And if you leave Christ to go back to Moses, there is no salvation for you there. Only the law will condemn you because Moses in the law said that one will come like unto him and him all the people must listen to. And if anyone will not listen to him, he shall be cut off. The prophecy of Christ, the Messiah, the promised one. And it's ironic that James White so totally misses the purpose of Hebrews that he condemns himself by pointing to it. Yes, it does get into the atonement and the law and everything else, but that's because it's written to a Jewish audience that lived under the real law of Moses, not the garbage they have today, which is rabbinical Judaism. Jews do not keep the law. They can't. It's impossible. God made it so. Uh, I mean, they can't even keep the form of the law. Absolutely impossible. So their rabbis whipped up a substitute for it themselves. They are the substitute. The, the Talmud and the Mishnah. Uh, so, and so James White is, uh, talks about the book of Hebrews, but he, he's apparently unaware of the purpose of Hebrews. And no, this is not a book, this is a difficult book to understand unless you were a Jew living under the law of Moses. It's a very good book, but you've got to know the Old Testament to be able to understand. But it is not the gospel. You don't have to have Hebrews. There are far more important books, like the Gospel of John and the Book of Romans. That would be where to start. It's like a Matthew, who is the other direct witness of the four Gospels. Only two are written by by eyewitness apostles, uh, Matthew and John. They are the primary witnesses. The others are uh, secondary, uh, second-hand witness. Uh, but people, it was all written in the, con in the uh, context of the church, so that, you know, all these eyewitnesses were around. But, I mean, the, the apostles chosen by Christ himself of the Gospels are written by Matthew and John. Uh, so they are the primary authority of the, on the life of Christ, what he did. Now, though, why, Hebrews is not a starting point. Let me just put it that way. Just like Book of Revelation. That is not where you want to start reading the Bible. Because you have to know the Old Testament prophets to read Book of Revelation and understand it. Otherwise, you'll be led astray by all kinds of false teachers including dispensationalists. But sometimes dispensationalists are way more right than Calvinists. It's, it explains, it, it puts it all together. There is no book in the New Testament that does not, that goes into the depth of the why and the how of atonement like Hebrews does. That's not true. <laughs> that is not true. So, so Hebrews is better than Paul, huh? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, 
maybe James White just likes books that are more difficult. But uh, the scriptures uh, clear that even a child can trust in Christ. A child's not going to understand Hebrews. Again, it, it's written to a particular audience. So you have to you have to go back and put yourself in the first century in the Jewish among the Jewish believers in Christ. And the practice of the of the Pharisees and the contemporary the temple was still standing when Hebrews was written. The animal sacrifices were still being done. That's obvious from the book. And the temptation was that you know, the, the Jews were pressuring Christians to, to leave Christ and go back to Moses and the law. But there is no salvation there. But James White's a theonomist, so he has rejected that. Theonomy, you know, it's like, that's what theonomy is about, imposing the law of Moses on the whole world. But you can't figure Hebrews out if you're unhitched from the Old Testament. You can't do it. True. <laughs> That's true. You, it's, it's, just, it's just a mystery book until you understand what's going on there. And so... So, so, the, so the New Testament is insufficient. Not really. You don't even have to know who Adam was, really. Because what's the central truth of Christianity? The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If he didn't raise from the dead, he wasn't who he claimed to be. And you're still in your sins. We've, we've criticized these things, and we've tried to give a response. So, so Andy Stanley, for whatever flaws he may have, in, in pointing people to the resurrection, the death and resurrection of Christ, is pointing them to the centrality of Christianity rather than Calvinism. <laughs> and the book of Hebrews... Does the book of Hebrews actually tell you how to be saved? Unlike Romans. See, Romans tells you how to be saved. What you must do to be saved. That this... That... ...wants these things. And... There seems to be a trajectory going on. I've seen a lot of stuff since the... True, and we see James Wise's trajectory. <laughs> stuff was posted about gay Christians, about what's going on at Stanley's churches. Okay, now, <clears throat> here's a difficult... Now, I don't know what Stanley's doing. Is he surrendering to the culture, or is he trying to reach the culture? Okay. Um, here's a problem in the culture wars. A transgender, homosexual, whatever, is no more a lost sinner than your typical American. <laughs> Even though, like, 65 to 70 percent of Americans still self-identify as Christians, how many actually are? How many even know what the gospel is? The biblical gospel. Why do I always get a still frame that makes James White look weird? I don't know. Grace of God, I guess. He, he doesn't he look like some mad monk out of history, you know, like uh, I believe he even has Greek letters written on his t-shirt. Maybe he's some mad Orthodox monk that escaped. Uh, type of situation. Well, he's got a piece of Greek manuscript in the back wall. In that fellowship, uh, how many people? Okay, now th this is a this is this can be this is a dangerous, tricky ground. Uh, if you're trying to reach the world of centers, sometimes you have to 
go among them. Which is sort of odd because James White uh, defended Mrs. Butterfield uh, when she uh, was attacked by certain elements in the Calvinistic camp, um, based on no evidence at all, really. So she she was walking in a you know a little bit of a minefield. When you go out, you you got to be careful. And I'm saying this from personal experience that when you're out there, you, you can get too close to to people that are not Christians. And um, you have to, Christ, you have to stay close to Christ. Because you, you cannot weaken the gospel in order to appease sinful people that love their sin. Uh, but I don't, from what, We'll listen to the clips. There here. are clearly gay affirming, and uh, uh, is Stanley gay affirming? What does gay affirming mean? That's not a sin, really. You're saying that a homosexual a homosexual lifestyle is not sinful. That's gay affirming. There's a lot of things that are sinful that uh, preachers will not talk about, too, by the way, in America. America is a wicked, sinful nation. Uh, what seems to be like the... But you'll find patriotism, the, the idolatry of patriotism, the idolatry of America among Southern Baptists, that's more of a problem. The inevitable direction of, of where they're going. And I hope not. Okay, no, it depends. Again, uh, there are others that are, there are many people that have tried to meet sinners where they are, but it's, it's a dangerous place to go. The apostles didn't do that. Uh, you, you look at Paul, where did Paul go? when he was going to preach the gospel? Did he go to the taverns and the brothels and the arenas uh, where people were rel uh, reveling in their sin? Or did he go to places of prayer and synagogues where he knew that God would have drawn people that were looking for salvation, that were convicted of sin and seeking an answer? Well, the answer is the latter. Places of prayer and synagogues. Now, a lot of Gentiles went to synagogues. Not converting, but just became, uh, they wanted to hear. The Holy Spirit had drawn them there, and they, they heard the law. And, of course, were convicted by it. But, uh, so, you need to preach the gospel in the churches not in the taverns. People don't go to the bar looking for Christ. <laughs> Fleeing from them, yes. I don't want to see any of that. Not, not, not that. That, you, but you. I mean, you can be saved in a tavern. I, I mean, but you're probably, uh, you know, that's not where the apostles went. Now, if something came up, you know, like they preach the the gospel to a to a Philippian jailer in prison. So, yeah, uh, you do it where you are, I guess. Even if you didn't choose the circumstances. Uh, when I when I responded last time, you know, I'm a PK. He's a PK. Um, uh, preacher's kid, if you're not into the Christianese. I'm older than he is, but not by that much. Um, maybe a decade. I'm not... If you got rid of that beard, you wouldn't look so old. I'm not sure exactly what his age is. I think he's in his 50s, so it'd be less than a decade. Um, I'm older than both of them. So. And I have attempted in providing a response to do so in such a fashion as to be fair and maybe to say something that he would hear. I mean, I, I don't, wouldn't expect him to be 
listening to me, but he is following me on Twitter, so maybe I know what I am going to do is I'm going to send him this link, a time index to when I began my comment. And that ain't gonna help. something that I say will be of, of assistance because I don't want to see, I, I truly believe that affirmation of destructive, self-destructive sin is the least loving thing. Okay, now, we, we, you'd think that these, some of these clips that James White's about to show us would show Andy Stanley affirming homosexuality because that's what James White's talking about. I haven't seen anything anywhere that would say that Andy Stanley affirms homosexuality. Yeah. The Christians can do. And that, in fact, if God's moral law is the mechanism whereby we are given the light to flourish as human beings, it is not the mechanism by which we are given the light to flourish as human beings. That's James White, the theonomist. That is the, the heresy, the false gospel of theonomy is that the law is the solution, not Christ. James White has traded the birthright of Christ for a bowl of beans. Especially in light of the, the secular insanity that is destroying our society around us. Tough. That's what the Bible says is going to happen. And it's happening before our very eyes. But the danger to Christians comes more from false Christians and false Christianity than it does from the world. And who so Christ is going to destroy the societies of this world when he returns anyway. They're going to be swept away. All the governments of it. But James White no longer believes. I don't think he ever did. Maybe once upon a time before he got into some of this stuff in a pre-millennial return of Christ or a millennial kingdom, future. He's abandoned all that for the lies of theonomy. Man will build the kingdom of God on earth through the law of Moses. And then once we've subdued the world to the law, we will turn it over to Christ. See, theonomy doesn't care about being born again. It wants to put the law on the nations. What does the law do? It condemns you. The law doesn't solve the problem of homosexuality. It condemns the sin. Just like it condemns the sin of the love of money. The world is full of idolatry, which call, God calls an abomination far more than homosexuality. Homosexuality is just, just a, another manifestation of sin. All sin leads to one place, death and hell. The law. Did the law of Moses save Israel? Did Israel flourish under the law? No. They were judged by God. It brought condemnation on them and exile and death, even under Moses in the wilderness. Then the most loving thing in the world is to not is to is to don't don't unhook anything that God hasn't unhooked. God has unhooked the law and the gospel. Apparently James White doesn't read the New Testament, except the portions he likes. Look at what he wants to debate with non-Calvinists. Calvinism. He just, he just, he's an evangelist for John Calvin. And now for a theonomy. Disciple of Rushduni, probably. 
because that's where it comes from. Very recent. And so I listened to this sermon and what came beforehand, and it really seems to me like in this context, briefly, it, it does seem that there's, I guarantee you one thing, uh, Andy Stanley does not preach nearly as long as Jeff Durbin does. <laughs> in fact, I would say there's probably, I'd say Jeff averages twice the length of, of Andy's sermons. Um, but it, it seemed to me like there was an attempt to communicate a gospel message. But because of certain theological shortcomings, the key and powerful elements of that message, which would exalt the holiness of God. That's not the gospel. Exalting the holiness of God is not the gospel. And call for the repentance of rebel sinners. That's not the gospel either. Rebel sinners, a Calvinist should know this. A monarch, somebody committed to monergism, that salvation is God's work. How is a sinner going to repent of what he is by nature? So you, so you, you go to, this is, Culture wars. This is an anti-gospel. You go to sinners and you command them to repent of their sin. To, see, repentance in the Bible is not putting away your sin. It's changing from unbelief to belief. You are condemned because of your unbelief, not because of the acts that you commit. Abraham was justified because of his belief in what God had promised, not because of his deeds. This is like Christianity 101, kindergarten Christianity, preschool Christianity. Is muted. No, I mean that, that thing, not what James White's saying. James White is, is uh, well, he's on the wrong side of the Tiber. In the sense that it becomes much more of a God's trying to get you to recognize how much you're loved message. Th that can become a problem, okay? Uh, but, see, that, that's one of the delusions that, that Christians have. Uh, we've, been, we've been told that the pro sinners just simply don't recognize that God loves them. They don't believe God loves them. That's a lie. <laughs> you need to actually go out and talk to some people. You know, go go to the prostitutes on the street and ask them if they if they believe in God. And ask them if they think that God loves them. And you'll find out they do. They pray all the time. They pray that God will send them a John down the street. <laughs> That's what I discovered. Yeah, I had these ideas. Oh, you know, this is stuff we hear. See, this is when we listen to people other than what God has given us for revelation, and we listen to these these Christians that write books. And do videos and stuff. So it's like me. If, if I'm not, I'm trying to point you to Christ and away from these scoundrels. But but I'm not necessary. Christ is. Let me. And my concern, we, concern we have. See, uh, the, the apostles did not go about repent of your sins. See, that's one of the false ideas that has been uh, that is pandemic among so-called Christians. Uh, I'm using in Christians in a generic, you know, people that call believe they're Christian, is that repentance is is repenting of your sins. Search the Scripture and find. Show me where that says that. the The word means metanoia, change your mind, a change of mind, a change of attitude. Uh, toward God, from it, it laying surrendering, realizing what you are. It doesn't matter what sins you've done. You, you're a sinner and worthy of hell. And, uh, the, and that conviction does not come 
because somebody's preaching the law to you. That will just flare up your rebellion. It comes because the Holy Spirit convicts you. That's his job, not yours. Your job is not to convict sinners of their sin. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And if he doesn't do it, it's not going to bring life. I've expressed many, many, many times is that when God's holiness and his wrath against sin is minimized in the proclamation of the church, the message of God no, excuse me, God's holiness and his wrath against sin is not the major element of the gospel. Again, this is what the Holy Spirit must do. When, when preachers get up and preach against sin, they are not providing life at all. The, the, the unbelievers already know they're sinners. God has made that known to them just like he has made his existence to them. It's just like foolish people that try to prove God's existence with their logic and philosophy and all this crap. The Bible declares that God has made himself known to all men through the things he's created. He constantly confronts them with his existence. And those that, re, that the Christians that think they've got to prove that God exists don't believe the scriptures. They don't believe the testimony of God that they're trying to prove exists. It's odd, isn't it? So the idea that, that we have to prove that God exists in order to get people to believe in him when God has said that he has already made himself known to everybody. <laughs> See, sin is... People act contrary to what they know is right. Homosexuals know they're committing sin. See, but the culture, the problem is that culture is, is, is saying is good and good and right now. Well, the culture in America has been saying the love of money is good and right, and, and capitalism, is, which is greed, uh, systematic greed, American culture is is rotten to its core. It's always been. The, the whole world is rotten to its very core. The, the, the God of this age, of this, of this world system, is Satan, according to the scriptures. So when I say that Satan's throne is in Washington, D.C., it's, uh, duh. He's the one that runs the world. And he uses smoke and mirrors to, to just obscure that fact. That's why we need God's revelation. But the, the knowledge of that fact, for example, is not the gospel. Just like uh, the fact that, that different things are sinful. In fact, everything is sinful. It's not done in faith. As, as the, it says in Proverbs, even the plowing of the wicked is sinful. Why? Because it's not done in faith. It's done out of selfish motiv motivations. Selfishness, self-centeredness is... is is, exists because you're cut off from God. You're not his image because he's not in you. You can't be the image of God without God being present. God's love in the cross becomes sticky sentimentality. It can be made into that. Rather than the astonishing reality of what God has done in glorifying himself and the death. The cross isn't about God's self-glorification. This is Calvinist poo-poo. It's not about, you know, the, the Calvinism is all, it's all about God's self-glorification. God does not need to glorify himself. You can, God can't be more glorious than he is. When the Bible talks about God glorifying himself, what does that really mean? It means God revealing himself to us so that we'll see him more as he really is, rather than how we imagine him to be. Now, let me point out one thing. If you look in Calvin's commentaries and you look in, like, John 3.16, it doesn't really do much for Calvin. John, Calvin does not get excited about the cross. No, that's not where he is or was. No, it's, that's not his thing. The gospel is not really Calvin's main thing demonstration of his own love and his own mercy and his own grace.
toward his elect people. Ah, yeah. No. No. Toward all mankind. The cross demonstrates it to all mankind. Now, when Calvinism talks about election, they're talking about, uh, God, well, they have a God that pre-ordains uh, all things in exhaustive detail, including sin. So, really, sin is just as much of the will of God, according to Calvinism, real Calvinism, as obedience to God is. It's all God's will, all decreed by God. And there's nothing you can do about it, including your own salvation. If you believe, it's because God decreed you'll believe. If you don't, it's because God decreed you, you don't. So, so, how can he talk about good and evil when it comes to God? The Calvinist God, you can't. That's not the God of the Bible. That's the God of Aristotle. If you look into it, look up Aristotle's ideas of God and then look at what's called classical Christian theism. You'll find out that really it's Aristotle's God, not the biblical God. Hmm. We need to get our ideas of God from the Scripture, um, from God's self-revelation. Uh, and to, to a degree, we can look at nat nature reveals us the existence of God and the power of God, but it doesn't reveal the character of God because nature itself is uh, affected by sin. And so with that, I want to play some of this and, and respond to it. Um, by the way, this is called fair use for everyone who... Um, Concern. That that won't necessarily stop the censors at YouTube. Concerned about these things. Oh uh, yes, and some some people like Joel Osteen's church will try to whack you and uh, with if you use portions of their videos to comment on. They don't care. See, YouTube doesn't care about the law. Uh, they will simply take it down, regardless. So yeah if somebody protests. They prove yourself innocent first. They don't care what the law says. They do what they want. They're a law unto themselves. Uh, I hope everyone will recognize that. It, it, that it's, we, are, we are doing this for educational and critique purposes, and so there is a law YouTube doesn't that, care about your disclaimer either. Uh, so let's, let's listen to it. I began to persecute the Jesus followers. I... Okay, now, he is, he is playing the role of Paul here. He's not saying personally, I began to persecute the Jesus followers. So he's sort of putting himself in the position of Paul and ad-libbing a bit here, as preachers often do. I was wrong, I was in error, I was an enemy. And while I was alive on this earth and God knew everything I was about to do. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. No open theism. <laughs> God. That has nothing to do with what Andy Stanley is talking about. That's just another Calvinist thing. God has it's exhaustive foreknowledge. At least that sounds like what he's saying. His son died for my sin anyway. Paul. Yes. The scandal that God sent his son into the world to save sinners. The God who justifies sinners. Who pronounces rebels against him as right with him because they believe him. Yeah, thank God. That gospel. I was still a sinner. Christ died for me. Right. For us. Before we did anything, before we knew there was anything that needed to be done, he did something for us. Two verses later, he writes this. He says, for if, while we were God's... So what is he doing? He's quoting, you can't see it because my I'm in the way. <laughs> He's quoting from Romans... Chapter 5, verse 10, yeah, NIV. For if while we were God's enemies, amen, we were reconciled to him 
through Christ on the cross. Yes, that is the gospel. Now, it doesn't say right there how we partake of the gospel. Yes, it's just like Christ died for the sins of the whole world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. Yes, Calvinism denies that. Well, if Calvinism rejects the scripture, you should reject Calvinism. Yeah, they just translate it as the, the world of the elect. No, just that's not. Uh, who are the elect? Those who believe God. Just, just forget the Calvinism stuff. Enemies, talking about himself and talking about some of us and all of us to some extent, right? <laughs> that, that, now that's a little lame. That's a little lame. All of us to some extent. Um, let's see, how much sin do you have to commit to be in the, in the category of a sinner? <laughs> uh, all of us to some extent. Yeah, that, that, that is a little lame, Andy. Uh, but yeah, because he's not, you know, pastors generally don't want to offend their congregation since that's where they get their pay from. Yeah, but that, yeah, that was a little bit unnecessary there. He, he is sort of soft and squishy, but it's a, he's a megachurch pastor. They all are. All of us to a far greater extent than we want to admit. True, true. We, we can't, you cannot, you can't. But really, I mean, is that something, this is sort of, Picking at nits here, um, nitpicking. Oh yeah, okay. So what is Stanley's really? You know, James White picked these clips as something he has to oppose. So far, it's like the gospel cannot under underplay the enmity that sin brings. Well, we now wait a minute. God dealt with the enmity at the cross. He, because Christ died for the sins of the whole world, it took sin as a separating issue out of the way. See, the universal atonement, this is where Calvinism is really, really wrong with their limited atonement. they, they got some really bad ideas about that. By the way, Calvin did not push limited atonement. He didn't. So it's not even Calvinism. A lot of things that are called Calvinism, not Calvinism, not Calvin. Uh, but God, the, the 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 issue of sin as a barrier to God saving sinners was dealt with on the cross by Christ dying for the sins of the whole world, which makes it possible for the holy and righteous God to treat sinful people with grace and mercy rather than destroy them in judgment. But if you believe in Calvinism, you can't believe that. Not real Calvinism. Because it's only, you know, in current Calvinism, because it's only for the elect. It's only for those that God shows well, I don't want to get into the creeds of Calvinism, but God chose before he created anything, he purposed to create sinners and saints. And the, the saints are the elect uh, individually. And it's, it's all pre-dawn. You're not saved because you believe God. You're saved because God elected you. And you're not going to hell because you, you didn't believe in Christ, but because God elected you to hell. It's double predestination. There's no way around that. Predestination of all things, in a, in, including sin itself, in every act, in every degree, all prescripted by God. The God of, of Calvinism cannot exist. And it's not the God of the Bible. You're still God's enemies. Before we did anything, before we knew there was anything to do, he went ahead and he reconciled us to him. And how? Right. On the cross, God reconciled the world to himself as far as the removing the barrier of human sin from God acting. See, God could not be just and holy and merciful and loving all at once 
with sin in the picture. So you had God reconciling the world to himself, taking sin, the barrier of sin, rebellion out of the way that could so God could deal with us. So God, God, see, God has, sin created a real problem for God because he is holy and just, but he's also merciful and loving. And he, he, he could not express the mercy and love without satisfying his holiness and mercy and, and, and justice. Because God can't do things like that. We can be inconsistent. God can't. God can't be. It's like God cannot lie. He just can't do it. Because God is truth. So it, there was a an issue that God had to satisfy as far as his relationship with sinful mankind. Because he's the one that gave the commandment, the day you eat of that tree you shall die. The law of sin and death is what that is. So, uh, yeah, the cross was necessary, absolutely necessary. From, from God's side, to reconcile God to sinful human beings. God had to get it out of the picture. He had to satisfy his justice and his word. What did he do? And he tells us through, through, through what? Through rule keeping, through doing our best, through making more promises. He says, no. He would say, look, I was the Pharisee of Pharisees. I tried that route. There's no peace. You never know where you stand. You just become judgmental. You mistreat other people thinking you're right with God. No, we're done with all that. This is not really the gospel part. This is, no, it's not about us. It's about primarily about God. I mean, yeah, uh, these things are true, but That's not the real purpose of the cross. Through. Okay. And this is the jumping off point for some of you. Because this is, this is the fork in the road. How, how do you find peace with God? He says, I'll tell you how. I tried the other way. Through the death of his son. Yes. Absolutely. That is the gospel. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die on that cross for sinners. In order that, which is what the Greek says, in order that, all who believe in him, not everybody, all who believe in him, that's a personal thing to believe in Christ. It's a relationship thing. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. See, God's salvation is based in his love. How can I love these sinners? How can I save these sinners? My justice says I must judge them. I must fulfill my word that the wages of sin is death. How do I deal with this? Oh, I'll send my son. He'll become a man and he'll die for them. So I'll satisfy my justice. He'll take the sins of the whole world upon himself as a sacrificial offering. And having satisfied my justice and my law, then I can treat them with mercy and love. And I can, uh, that I can justify them on the basis of faith rather than on the basis of obedience. Amen and very true. But... What do the so what's the real complaint about what Andy Stanley's saying there? Yeah, you can nitpick at it, but I can nitpick at what I say. I mean, it's... <laughs> so what's the issue? Scriptures say the reason for that death was. It wasn't to produce a strong emotional feeling. Well, what does that have to do with anything? It was first and foremost to deal with with the penalty of sin, the bro 
isn't that what Andy just said? Didn't he just read what Paul wrote? So James White, is he criticizing Andy Stanley or is he criticizing the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans? See, th these aren't really Calvinist passages here. <laughs> Certainly not Theonomist passages, because Theonomists believe that salvation's in the law. Well, at least civilizational salvation. They wouldn't say personal salvation, but civilization. The civ the, the, uh, well, uh, if law was the answer, America, who has so much law, should be heaven. Broken law, so as to provide the mechanism of justification. Okay, first of all, the law didn't even exist until Moses. Abraham was justified apart from the law, wasn't he? Because there was no law. And our righteous standing before God. So the, the problem is... Through what? What's our righteous standing through? Election or faith? Well, you know where James White stands. You can talk about the death of his son, but the why of that death... You don't have to know the why. Because Paul talks about that in Romans 10. What do you, what do you have to know? Well, how can a child understand the book of Hebrews? Uh, why would you have to if you're not Jewish? If you're not, if you were never under the law of Moses, why would you have to discover, to understand that? And what the again, what the purpose of the law of the book of Mo, of uh, Hebrews is, is not proclaiming the gospel to Gentiles. It's warning Jewish believers not to fall back and apostatize to Moses, because there's no salvation there. Death is intimately hooked permanently to the law of God. No, it's not. The law is temporary. It's not the eternal covenant. Christ is the eternal covenant. The book of Hebrews declares that, that it was temporary until the eternal covenant came in. And what did Jesus Christ establish? The new covenant, the promised covenant. The covenant was a promise in the law and the prophets. Salvation, the covenant of salvation, the law is not that at all. It was just brought in temporarily until Christ. The, 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 the communion meal, what do we remember there? That What did Jesus say? This took up the cup of wine, the cup of redemption, I believe that would have been, and uh, in the Jewish Passover meal. So, but you don't have to know about that either. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. This represents that, what I'm about to do this very day. Why I'm going to die on the cross? to bring in the new covenant. And his, his apostles didn't ask him what you're talking about. What are you talking about, new covenant? Because they knew what was promised in the prophets. All the Jews were waiting for the coming of the Savior, the Messiah. But you don't have to. You, you don't have to know and understand everything to be a believer, to trust in Christ, to save you. You know you're sinful. You know you've sinned. Every child knows they've sinned. They get guilty. They try to hide things. They know they're sinners. They know God exists. Everybody does. And the God of Calvinism is not the God you need to present to them, the God that sent his son into the world because he loved sinners enough to send his son to die for them. And when the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin, you will know what a wretch you are. He will show you the truth about yourself. He also will show you that Christ died for you.
And because of that, what Christ did, you've been reconciled to God. To that broken law, to the whole history of sin. The law is obsolete. It doesn't mean that the sins, the things under the law aren't sinful. And the law is not holy and good and true. It just does nothing to save you. It just condemns you. It is the problem. It is, it, it, it is the barrier that keeps you from God. The Christ, God in Christ has removed the barrier of the law. The condemnation of the law, if you trust in Christ. And when we focus upon what the triune God is doing in salvation, and then see how we benefit... That is the death of cross uh, of Christ and the cross. You don't... James White does not even understand these things. I don't know if he's born again. Does the Spirit of Christ dwell in you? That is the identifying mark of a Christian. If you've been born again, you ought to understand that Christ has saved you. You ought to be able to recognize that, yes, uh, his Spirit is in me. I belong to him. You ought to focus on what the apostles say, not on people on YouTube say. Ed reading the book of Romans is much more edifying than listening to me, too. Fit from that, rather than starting with us. But that's what Andy Stanley is doing. He's preaching straight out of Paul's book on the gospel. And then trying to reason backwards, it all becomes very, very clear. I think it's important. <laughs> and it's not about the, the, the law is the problem, not the solution. For... If, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Well, that's the gospel. The reason that the gospel, the reason that the arrival of Jesus, the reason the message of Jesus is good news is because we don't good our way in. True. We don't behave our way in. Absolutely. Any more than my children behave their way into our family. Best news of all. He's paraphrasing what Paul teaches in Romans. I just, and Galatians and Ephesians and what Jesus taught in John chapter 3. Point out in passing that the only way to actually make sense of what was just said is if you affirm the doctrine of election. That's absolute bullshit. I was looking for a more appropriate word. No, there is not a more appropriate word than that. Dung, scabalon in the Greek. <sighs> Paul uses that word. Scabalon, which in popular English is bullshit. Dung, worthless, refuse. What's not good for you? Oh, that's what Calvinism is, not good for you. No, it's not. It's a, election is irrelevant. See, if we're saved by God's election and the predetermination by God of all things, exhaustively, including our sin, then what is the meaning of the cross at all? It doesn't reveal God's love at all. It's just kabuki theater. Just shadow puppets. The nonsense. See, the God of Calvinism, which is the God of Aristotle, the changeless, impassable, the utterly changeless, utterly impassable non-entity that could not have created anything and certainly could not have become man, is not the God of the Bible. See, when you understand what they're really saying behind those words and those confessions, what, what they mean by them, and that, that's where the work of trying to understand Calvinism really comes at. 
Now, see what the problem is, most Calvinists, they try to reconcile that poo-poo with the Scripture, which results in seriously damaging the Scripture. Just the problem is Calvinism. Just discard it. Then it's not hard to understand. Even a child could understand it. A child could understand being guilty. They feel condemnation for their sins and disobedience. And they, feel, they know they're rebels. The Holy Spirit can convict them, too. But no, we're not saved by election. We're saved by God through faith in Christ. See, but election makes all that null and void. Because election, you're it's elected. Not just, you, there's not just election to heaven, there's election to hell. God chose some, cho chose to create some as the elect and chose to create others as non-elect. And their eternal destiny is absolutely determined. So none of the rest means anything. What is the cross? God could have just determined you to be elect without... See, Calvinism is utterly inconsistent. It makes no sense. And you have to be really come up with some sophisticated nonsense to try to reconcile Calvinism with the Bible. And that's why Calvinists are so uppity, because I've been able to reconcile Calvin with the Scriptures. Well, actually, they haven't, but they think they have. It's only when you understand what their God and what Calvinism is really saying, and yet that's in Aristotle. Uh, the impassibility. That's why the, the Reformed Baptists have blown up now. <clears throat> That didn't last long. Kapawi, because you can't mix oil and water. You can't mix pagan, the, the pagan ideas of God with God's self-revelation without coming you know, becoming, um, well, at best, unstable. It's the idea of, you know, we're human beings, and therefore we're, we're, we're just all God's chillins. No, we're not. Okay, that did Andy say that? He was just present. Now, James White is not showing that in the clips he's presented, has he? So why did he? So are these the worst clips of Andy that James White could come up with? I think he hasn't made his case that Andy is preaching a false gospel from what? Otherwise, he's made a case that Paul is preaching a false gospel. I would say the only solution to this is to reject James White and his theonomy and his Calvinism. Because it's not biblical, it's an anti-gospel. It's poisonous. And the law does not promote the flourishing of civilization. Otherwise, Old Testament Israel would be, you know, something other than what they were. Which was generally under the, under the judgment of God. Okay, so that's enough of that. Uh, oh, yikes. This is why, I, why did I bother to? to even look at James White, because this always happens. But why why is he attacking Andy for actually preaching the gospel? This is about as close as anybody comes to preaching the gospel. I mean, this this is this is like, okay, he's just straight out of Romans. Christ came and died for sinners to reconcile us to God. Yes. James White doesn't believe the gospel. He doesn't believe that Christ died for the sins of the whole world. He rejects all that. He rejects the scripture. Unless, except for those portions that agree with his form of religion, which is a danger in all denominations. To You have committed yourself to a form of religion 
rather than to God's self-revelation. And it is a filter that blinds you to the truth, to the gospel, blinds you to the reality of who God is and God's love for sinners. God has chosen to love the unlovable. And his, Jesus bases God's salvation in God's love, not election. 